So, welcome, and uh, I will start by introducing myself. My name is uh, Paulo Lopez. Uh, I am a principal software engineer for Red Hat. Uh, the, the blue arrow there is just a coincidence. <laughs> And uh, if you want to uh, follow me on Twitter, that's my Twitter handler. So in this uh, uh, small presentation, I don't know how many of you were here on the session before. Can uh, well, some? Okay, that, that that that's good. Like in the previous session, there was like an introduction to to Graal VM, and in a really short time, you can think of Graal VM as a compiler for compilers. So you get code in and outputs uh, uh, bytes that the pro your pro CPU can, can execute. And it's, it's a very large project. It's, it's about uh, creating a polyglot environment for many different languages. And one other sub-project is creating native images. On this talk, I will only focus on native images and not on the other aspects. So what is a native image? Let's think of the uh, very simple hello world, which in this case I'm just introducing myself. If you think of an uh, application that prints an hello, hello message, you would just compile it. If you run the command, you see Java, and there's no output. That's like what the compiler does. And then you run the native image uh, hello command that, sh that is bundled with a Graal VM SDK. And you wait a while, like 22 seconds, and you have a, a binary. This binary is pure uh, um, assembly code. It's, it's not a, a wrapper around a jar file and a JVM that auto decompresses at runtime. No, this is really the all code and plus all the required Java language and Java virtual machine uh, pieces translated into uh, assembly and then creates an L file. Currently, it only creates L files because it only runs on uh, Unix-like operating system, so Linux, Mac OS. Um, but uh, as you heard before, the GraalVM team is working on getting it to work also on Windows, so there will be also PA, PE files. So if you run this, this uh, uh, generated uh, binary, then you can compare it with a, with a standard uh, Java implementation. So if you do a very basic, naive test, you just time how long does it take for your application to run? So you do time Java hello, and you see that your, your application takes about 85, um, 85 milliseconds to, to, to run, which is quite some time just to print a message. Uh, so simple like, hi, I'm Paolo. And then if you run the same command with a native image, you'll see that your application runs in four milliseconds. So if you look at this, you see, whoa, you, your application just got a 20 times speed up. So the first assumption that most of us will make is that native images are super fast. It's like the Ferrari of the, of the, the Java, Java world. But again, it's an assumption. So if you start thinking of this, you should think uh, what's the next step. Next step would be like compare, make a, run a benchmark. So for, for comparison reasons, if you run uh, the, the Tech and Power benchmark, which you can find on this website, you'll find very interesting numbers. So Tech and Power is a, a, it, it's a, it's a benchmark that is focused on latency numbers. How, how fast can your uh, application return uh, a response? It, it's based on HTTP workloads. So it's like a HTTP REST endpoint and see how long does it take to serve a static file, to do a database round trip, to do a bunch of uh, uh, database uh, round trips and get uh, the, the uh, uh, assemble a response and return it. And here you'll notice something really interesting, like using the, the Graal JIT compiler in, in Java, which is the blue line, you'll see that you will get about three times the performance of native code. So this gets you like thinking, hmm, what's, what's going on here? So if you think a bit more about this, you'll get to the idea, okay, okay, native images are not super fast as we thought, but maybe they are fast enough. It's, it's not a Ferrari anymore. It's a, it's a, it's a funny old, old Fiat. So 
how can we improve this? So we can improve this in, in several ways. So as we saw on the presentation before, there are two flavors of the, the GraalVM. There's the Community Edition, and there's the EE Edition. They, well, as you can uh, expect, like the Community Edition is based on open source components, while the Enterprise Edition has a better compiler, as it was said, and a, a couple of other features. And these other features are really important for native images because one of the features is that it will allow you to do profile guided optimizations. So what does this mean is that if you have your uh, native image compiled and you know exactly what kind of workload your application will be uh, uh, handling, you can train your application to, to, to that workload and then you will output some information in a, in a separate file that will tell the, the Graal compiler what is a typical hot path, hot path on your code. So once you know the hot path, path on your code, then the, the compiler can do some profile guide optimization. So it will inline some parts of the code. It will uh, uh, reduce the, try to reduce the, the, the number of allocations and so forth. The second important aspect of the, the, the Enterprise Edition is that it will include dwarf symbols on your binaries. So as a Java developer, probably you're not, not aware of what dwarf is, but dwarf in, 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 in ELF files is a, a piece of information that is bundled with every binary that will tell you like a stack traces uh, and make a, a relations between pointers and uh, uh, function names. And this is very important if you, for example, go in production and you get a, a crash, then you need to, to be able to know, well, my application crashed on this uh, uh, memory location, so what does, it, what does it mean? So using the dwarf, you can translate this memory location to a function name, so you can debug it. So if you can debug it, you can also uh, profile it, and if you can profile it, you can optimize it. So the native images can become fast, like, like, a, like a V8 engine uh, uh, truck. And uh, in, in, in they, they do have like sp specific use cases. They, they, it's, it's not like a one solution fits all, one size fits all. So if we need to think about what, uh, what kind of the use cases there are out there. You can, you, we can separate this into two areas, like native images and regular images, regular JVM applications. So if you think about uh, native images, uh, those are suitable for uh, applications where the startup time matters. So uh, in, I, as I lost, listed here, like short running command line applications, serverless uh, cloud functions, because you just run the function and you terminate the process, or cases where your memory footprint also matters. So say that your application always requires a very small amount of memory, say something between 100 megs and one gigabyte, then the, the native image can, can work in, in those specific constraints. And uh, the final topic that I, I wrote here is that if you want to use a native image, you, your application needs to know all the code that can be reached at, at, at compile time. Because um, without knowing this, there's no, no way to translate the, 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 the bytecode to, to assembly. So the second case is like, when should we use a, a, a regular JVM? So you should use a regular JVM if you're doing like st stuff like big data, because your, 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 your amount of memory your, does matter. When you have uh, uh, heaps of gigabytes or terabytes, then the, the, the current garbage collector in, in the hotspot or OpenGDK, Oracle GDK, it doesn't matter, is way more optimized than the, the very simple algorithm presented on, 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 on native images. If you are using frameworks with lots of reflection, and think of uh, frameworks with lots of annotations, think Spring, for example, it will be kind of complicated to be sure that all code is available at, at, at the, the build time. And 
lots of information is not available at build time, but it needs to be computed at runtime. So the, the native compiler does not have these insights and will not be able to translate your application. You might be able to translate it, but you will need to by hand specify all the code that is used by reflection and you make a use list and you need to list all the methods and all the, the reference uh, that are uh, used in your application. So if you think of uh, use cases, the typical use case for using a native image would be like doing a serverless. So uh, I prepare a small demo using OpenFAS. OpenFAS, uh, I just chose it because it's very easy to install. It's just like a one command line and you have it installed. So I'll, I, I have a demo. In, in this case, because I would need to download a couple of Docker images in the, for this specific de demo, I just recorded myself and I will just walk through what, what's happening. So I have like an empty uh, project. I ask my OpenFast to create a new project specifying a language which will, I will call the Vertex SVM, which is a, a, a mapping to, to a template. So we just created a couple of files on my, on, on my environment. I can now just open the, my function. And here you can see that it's just a plain Java file that in this case is just uh, printing out some, some message. I will change it to hello GFL. And now you just need to tell OpenFast to, uh, to build this, this function. So what happened behind the scenes, it will create a, a Docker container for us. So the con in this case, because everything was cached, the, the, the build was really fast and now I need to deploy it. So here you'll see that the startup of the application will be really fast. So as you saw, I, I typed and automatically got deployed. So I have my function deployed. I can invoke as many times as I want and you see like the round trip doesn't really change much. It's, it's about uh, two to 20 milliseconds depends on the, on the my network and this is just local and there's like a proxy in between the function. So now I can look at what's happening inside Docker and inside Docker you can see that if I, I think I stop this, you see that um, I'm, my, my function is now just using 20 megabytes of RAM. And uh, if you would think of making a, 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 a Java application, you would see here at least 100 MBs of, of RAM because all the required machinery. Um, in the presentation uh, uh, the description, I said that uh, I could run a function in less than 10, mi 10 megabytes of RAM, and that's true. The difference here is that in this specific example, because I wanted to keep it like as simple as possible, I didn't disable the support for HTTPS. If I would remove all the security features from the native image, then the size of the image uh, would, would, uh, would, you cannot, the size, uh, you don't really see the size of the image, but you, you would see like the size of the image would be reduced in about 20 megabytes. And then the RAM usage would drop from 20 to set seven, give it or take. But just to, to keep it simple on, 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 on demonstrations, I, I decided to keep, uh, keep everything included. So. Let's talk about uh, what happens behind the scenes. What happens behind the scenes when you're working with uh, native images. So native images are built with an ahead of time compiler. So how does this ahead of time compiler work? In, in, in a nutshell, the, this compiler will start loading your, your uh, bytecode from your, from your main public static void main entry point. And from there, we'll create like a, 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 the graph of all the, the dependencies on classes and methods that your application needs. From that list, it will see if all code is reachable. If it's reachable, then it starts translating this bytecode into native assembly. Of course, uh, a direct translation is not enough. So 
and because we don't want to include a, a, a JVM with your binary, it, it has a small library which is called Substrate VM and this library will give you like the basic capabilities that you would find on, on JVM like a garbage collector um, and a couple of other, other helpers. So it's really important that your, your, your code uh, uh, tries not to use reflection because otherwise uh, it's, it's impossible to, for the compiler to know which methods are reachable and which methods are not reachable because the, what the compiler is doing is, is, is that if it doesn't f uh, manage to, to reach uh, a function or a method in, 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 your, in your classes then it assumes that that method is not needed so we will not translate it so it's really excluded from your binary so if you use a reflection then it can happen that it starts to removing too much uh, unused classes and methods that in fact were needed so what's important to notice is that this substrate vm is not a jvm as I said, it's just like a very small subset of features and even the features that are there are not exactly one-to-one uh, -one mapping um, and one example is the, the garbage collector and the second one is because since the code has been already translated into assembly there is no just-in-time compiler anymore so the, the, the final binary will not uh, perform better with time like it does on a JVM because on a JVM as the, the JIT compiler uh, uh, observes that some methods are being used more often then it op optimizes those for the specific workload once it's, uh, it's assembly then because it, on, on, on native images it's assembly always then there's no uh, further optimizations so what works and what doesn't work on, on this substrate VM and here you can see, try to, to map if you are using any of these features and if, this, if you're using one of the features that is marked as with a cross then you're out of luck, you cannot uh, use native images so dynamic class loading, unlo unloading so this means if you're probably still working with application servers uh, you're probably out of luck because that's pretty much how you do the isolation between uh, uh, contexts and, and multiple uh, applications on the same application server. If using reflection, there are ways to get things to work as Oleg just uh, described in, in a previous presentation. You, there is a JSON file where you can list all the classes and methods that your application needs. So those are not excluded during the translation part. If you're using dynamic proxies because it's a bit similar to reflection, you, it might work or not. If you're using both dynamic method handles, um, probably this is only for people who are using like uh, uh, scripting languages, then it, it will not work. Threads work, synchronize, uh, wait, and notify work. Um, if you're using security managers, again, like application servers, that will not work. Method references mostly works. Finalizers, uh, they don't work and that's the, re the reason is that since they want to remove it from, from the, the Java spec they didn't even bother trying to implement it uh, on, on native images so just, just waiting for it to, to fade away and because it's, it's GraalVM, it's all about being polyglot and running any kind of code you might be able to run uh, JNI you still need some kind of glue and some annotations but you can now uh, link your, your Java code to a C library and uh, still use it as before and interesting enough the unsafe, the class that never dies uh, <laughs> still, still works and that's mostly because so many frameworks depend, depend on it so they, they decided to implement it and finally to end this list uh, static inil initializers work and this is a very important aspect the reason why native images uh, are so fast when they start it's not just because they are pure assembly the, the, the second trick that GraalVM does when he builds a, a native image is that when it's translating the, the code it runs all the static, in, uh, static class initializers in your code 
once he does this, he knows exactly how the, the heap should look like when your application starts. And it saves a snapshot of that heap in the native image itself. So when the application starts, it loads that, or all the initialization, initialization, static initialization is already in memory. So there's no need to look up for system variables and run a couple of helper methods. It's, it's already there. So that's the, the, the second trick to make it uh, so fast to start. Then lambdas, of course, the, they work because they're just anonymous in the classes, identity, hash codes, and, and so forth. And finally, like the JVM specific uh, features like JMX, JV, JVMTI for debugging, they don't work because uh, those those are really specific to the to the hotspot and 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 in order to to get uh, the, this you would need also to translate uh, the JVM so they are outside. There are ways to debug. Um, if you compile your native image with uh, um, Google Inspector protocol enabled, this means that you can debug your application using the, uh, your Google Chrome because it will use the same protocol as Google Chrome does to, to talk to, to V8. And this feature is, is, is pretty interesting because it was something that the GraalVM guys decided to, to use. Since they were doing a polyglot runtime, they had to decide how would they debug Java, JavaScript, Python, C, uh, and so forth. So instead of writing uh, a debug protocol for each language uh, using like the, the, the usual tools, they found out if they would just write one debug protocol using the, the, the Chrome Inspector protocol format, then uh, you have like a, a, a global debugger for, for everything. So the bad news about uh, building native images is that not every application can be converted to a uh, native image, to substrate VM uh, native images. So, and uh, you always need to remember there is no JIT. It's all pre-compiled ahead of time. So if your application runs, uh, when you do a, a request to your application, it takes X milliseconds. After warming it up like a thousand times, it will still take another the same X amount of milliseconds because nothing will be optimized. The second is because uh, there is no, no JIT. The, the GC, the GC, the garbage collector algorithm is, is is simpler. The team behind Graal uh, created a extra API that to allow you to do some uh, um, atomic uh, uh, isolation of uh, start start collecting uh, allocating memory and uh, allocating memory and do a garbage collection of the the whole block at once. But this API, to my eyes, is not really interesting in the sense that once you start using it to optimize your, your code, then you're really locked to native images. Um, it, it means that you will always be tied to, to, to GraalVM. You cannot then run your code on OpenJDK, for example. But it's not all bad news. There are also good news. Like the good news is that if you're using Eclipse Vertex, uh, m most stuff works. Like it depends, of course, on, on the modules you're mixing. But out of the box, we can get like a web servers, Redis, Postgres, gRPC, which is kind of really complex mach machinery behind it. Uh, also works SockJS, WebSockets, uh, OAuth, uh, HTTPS, uh, and so forth. I could continue with the enumeration, but there's no, no point. Once you build an application with Vertex and all these things, you'll notice that it will use low resources, so uh, just a few megabytes of memory and a few megabytes of disk space instead of having uh, like a full-blown JDK, which in average is like 150 MBs, if you remove a thing here or there. And of course, you have a fast startup because of the things I just uh, explained before. So I have I have a demo, and uh, I, the source code can be uh, link, uh, seen with uh, with with this link. But I will 
uh, I can share it uh, after the, the, the presentation. So, let me introduce the demo. So, in a, nut in a nutshell, because I wanted to get as many things I could in, in, a, single, in a single demo, I decided that I have an application that is a vertex application, and I want to make it, uh, I want to, to watch in real time all the Bitcoin transactions um, that are happening uh, in, 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 graphical, in graphical way. Because Bitcoin is sometimes like, a, uh, it, it's, it's about money, so I decided to protect my application using OAuth. So I will uh, use my GitHub uh, account to, to validate my, my um, identity. And once I, uh, I pass my, my, my challenge, I will open a, a web socket to a website called blockchain.info and this web socket, it's an API that they have, will, will in real time start sending me a stream of unconfirmed transactions because I decided to pick these ones because these ones are like constantly happening, so you see things happening right away. So once I receive the, one of these transactions, I will perform a, a SQL insert into Postgres so I save it, so I can look at, uh, at them in the future if I want. And once the, my data is inserted, I will publish an event to the event bus. So the event bus is a feature of Vertex which allows you to uh, scale your application without uh, bothering knowing where all the other nodes are. And one cool feature in my perspective is that we can breach this event bus with the browser. So I can start now sending messages uh, from my application to browsers and browsers can talk back to my application and I don't need to know IP addresses, uh, network locations and so forth. It's just like a simple, a simple pub sub kind of uh, mechanism. So if I would need to, to describe the code, first thing is that uh, you shouldn't be afraid of the, the writing public static void main. And that, that means that uh, you, can, you can bootstrap your application uh, very easily so you know exactly what it does and this also helps your native, uh, native image compiler to, to, to analyze your code and know what to translate. So in this case I create a vertex instance I get a reference to my event bus, I create connection to my Postgres. Don't worry about the code, like I'll share the, the, the link in the end, but this is just get like a gist of what's going on. So once I have a Postgres connection, I create a connection to, a WebSocket connection to my blockchain.info site. So, and then it's important again that there, there is no magic and by this I mean there are no uh, annotations or, or, or things that are inserted at runtime. So everything is explicit. Everything is explicit. So you need to say like, I'm running a prepared statement in Postgres and this is my uh, SQL statement and this is my uh, argument. And once I get the result, then I can continue with my code. So it's important, again, to to stress this, like implicit APIs will always work. This, this because, um, because nothing is being injected, there are no really reflection. The, the, the native, native compiler can automatically create the, the full tree of, uh, the, full, the full graph of, of all the dependencies of your code, so it will get all the right pieces translated to, to native. And last part is that recently on, I think on release candidate seven, there is support for HTTPS. Uh, and again, this just works out of the boxes. You just use like the typical Java key stores. Uh, you create a key store, uh, you fill in the, the, the certificates and you can just load it and you have a, like a HTTPS application. So if you build it, and this is an uh, interesting part, which I have a slide, but I'll show you later. Now it's the time that you can ask your, your, your manager to buy some, uh, uh, some gadgets to entertain yourself, because as you could see for a very simple application, 
it took on my laptop almost three minutes to build. So you can like uh, buy like some swords and stuff because this is uh, how long it takes. So if I if I wouldn't need to, to run it, and I have uh, here the, the application. So here I have, uh, I, uh, for some reason I'm debugging. I don't know what, but um, uh, so this is again like the the, the same code as I said before. Like I have. Here, as you can see, the full application is around 100 lines of code, and this includes all the includes on the top. So if I would go, if I would go over, okay, I have uh, the vertex event buzz, as I said, I create the database connection. Uh, every time I get a message from my blockchain uh, uh, API, I insert it uh, to Postgres once it's succeeded then I just uh, get the value of all the, the, the transactions within into a single value and I publish it to the event bus. And later I have an HTTP router uh, where I can now breach the event bus to my browser. This is basically what you need to do. And then I set up some uh, uh, security which I'll use GitHub for this. And some more set up like, uh, well, I need cookies and sessions. And finally, create my HTTPS server and I run it. So, uh, as again, because I didn't want to spend much time uh, 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 showing like the, the, the weight that you need to, to compile, I've uh, bundled everything in a, in a Docker Compose file. So I have two services, I have uh, Postgres and I have my application and my Docker file. Basically, I'm using the official Graal VM uh, 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 Docker image. Then I just copy my Maven files there and I run my, my Maven command uh, with a profile native image to, to build a native image. And uh, the Docker, the official Docker, the official Docker image is about 500 MBs of, of, of space. So you might think, well, that's kind of a bit too much and you don't need all the machin machinery that's included. There's no need for the, the JVM and so forth. So we'll use a small, a small, uh, a small uh, um, base image. Uh, sadly, uh, Graal VM native images depend on glibc. So you cannot use a pure Alpine base image. So you cannot go for the sh small 4 MBs base image. You need to get an Alpine image with glibc. And these are about 10 to 12 megabytes of space. So it's not that bad. And because I was, as I said, I, I enable security. We need to install the security certificates and up to the moment, this is a, 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 a an hack that you still need to do, but it's like the official hack. Like if you want to run the security stuff, you still need to have one DLL on your system, and this DLL is called the Libsun uh, Elliptic Curve uh, .so. So you need to copy it from the from the base image. So then you start your application. So I do compose hub. So as you saw, like my application started uh, almost instantly or instantly. So if I would now go, uh, let me, I need to copy, otherwise I'll lose the, um, or I can just, I can just go here and do HTTPS local host. Eight. Yeah, that's what happens when you <laughs> localhost 8443. So my connection is not private. That's because I'm using a, a self-generated certificate. That's uh, good to know. So I can say, yes, proceed. And now you see that the security part. Well, I'm on, my application is on HTTPS. And then the second part was that 
for security, I'm using GitHub, so I need to put my authenticate. So, so let's see if this works. Now I need to get my password. I think I need my code, so this is kind of fun. You can use all your gadgets. So I need to go GitHub and I so if this works, now I get back to my application and now you see like in real time. So this is, um, what you see here is that uh, uh, the WebSocket connection to blockchain.info is getting all these transactions uh, in, in real time because it's a WebSocket. Um, then I'm inserting them into Postgres, which I don't think I, there's a way to really visualize it, no. And once they are inserted, the messages come back to my application and the application publishes a message with uh, the value. And the bigger the value, the bigger, the, the, the darker it gets and the longer the, the longer the chain is, the longer it uh, gets in, 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 in length. So now we, that we see this, I, we can do again the same exercise of going here and do, um, if I get the mouse, go here and can do again uh, docker stats, and then I can do, I think you can specify here, um, Bitcoin, I have, I have lots of images running. I have Bitcoin viewer. I want. I don't care about the Postgres. I want to see my native image. So if this works, now you can see that, for example, this application because it's it it's doing a bit of work. It's going to a database, is getting stuff in real time and publishing um, data to the browser and communicating that the, all stuff gets acknowledged. It's using around, well, 90 megabytes of, of RAM. If you think, if you would do, if I would run the same application just on a pure JVM, this would be uh, 150 to 100 MBs. And you can see the year that my CPU is, is not really busy, although there's lots of things going on, like talking to Postgres, committing transactions, confirming and doing all this stuff. So. As you can see, there's lots of things you can already already do. So if I go back, so um, what I can tell is that you can already use Vertex for lots lots of things. Uh, you can write uh, servers, you can write uh, clients, and this example is a bit exaggerated. So probably it's not something that you really want. But for example, imagine that in your in your daily job, you 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 need to write lots of scripts to automate things, and these scripts are are slow. You can write those scripts now in Java and compile it to a native image, and you have like really fast tools. Um, we can talk to Postgres databases, use doc, web, web sockets, routing cookies, sessions, basically all the components I had to use on the application. I didn't use Redis, but Redis is also working, gRPC or SSL, etc., etc., etc. So, what I can tell you is that if, if you want, uh, you sh and maybe you should, you should try to experiment with native images. They, they, they can be fun. They will always give you. They will also give you lots of headaches because things will not work out of the box for the first time. So, in order to help you with um, with that, I have I have like uh, six tips uh, for you. So, tip number one: your application needs a, a, a HTTPS or any security related uh, feature, and your native image fails to to build. And the, my tip is: don't forget to put this to command line flex. You need to enable all security services and need to enable URL protocols, HTTPS. If you don't do this, all the security components are uh, not included in your binary and nothing, nothing will work and the error is really cryptic. It just says, uh, uh, no, most likely we'll get a null pointer on some internal uh, uh, Sun class. Uh, tip number two, like when you're trying to run your um, 
your native image application and in your code or in one library that your code uses, some uh, a static initializer allocates uh, a memory. In other words, it does a, like a new object and saves it as a static reference. This will fail to compile to a native image because uh, as I said, GraalVM is making a snapshot of the, 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 the heap uh, uh, as it, it compiles. So if you allocate memory um, while you're building, it, it of course you'll get like a wrong uh, memory location when you run it. So co the native compiler will uh, recognize that, that pattern and will bail out and say uh, stop with an error. So what you need to do is pass an uh, extra command line argument, say delay class initial initialization to runtime and you specify here the class name. So that's, that part of the heap is not initialized when you're building. Of course, this has the penalty that when your application starts, it needs to uh, initialize that class. So it can in increase one or two milliseconds to your startup. Uh, tip number three, like uh, you bundle your resources on your jar file. Uh, now you have a, a binary file, L file. There, there's no concept of jar file or zip files where you can look, look up the resources. What you need to do is specify another command line and uh, command line argument where you specify which uh, resources in your jar file are you using. And in that case, what uh, the compiler is doing is that it copies those resources into the data segment of your ELF and they are available as if they were before. Uh, tip number four, like uh, you use a library or your code uses a bit of reflection and the native compiler removed it. So when you start your application, you get like a class not found exception or method not found uh, ex exception. What you need to do is specify uh, this command line flag and in that JSON file you need to make an uh, array, a JSON array listing all the, 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 the classes that you need. Uh, tip number five is like, okay, uh, your application requires some optional classes, but as I said, the native compiler needs to know everything ahead of time, so we, it will assume because uh, the, it cannot find a class that your application is incomplete, you can say, okay, if you miss some classes, uh, compile anyway, and then just give me an exception at runtime. So that's how we know what you do it. And the tip number six, like if nothing else works, uh, just open, a, open an issue and uh, uh, Graal, G, uh, Graal uh, uh, GitHub uh, repository, because the, they are quite helpful and they kind of re reply to things really, really quick. So uh, with this, I kind of um, conclude my presentation. If there are any questions, so please go ahead. I'm a bit uh, ahead of time, so we have time for questions, if there are questions. Yes, there's a question up there. How is, uh, how is Graal useful in a uh, cloud environment? Because we don't know in what server you are, so how, how, is, how is Graal uh, useful in the real world, even uh, in a cloud environment? So the question is, how is Graal useful in a cloud environment? That is a very good question. In, in I don't think no one can really t give you an answer right now uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, you, you need to think in a cloud environment, most likely you'll be like in a, a Docker-like environment or Kubernetes or whatever, where your distribution is based on image layers. So if you think that you deploy the application in a JVM, you have like one layer with the JVM that is shared about with all the Docker uh, containers, and then your application layer is just like a jar file, a very tiny. Once you compile native image, you need to deploy the full big blob. So like one deployment is like, one layer is always gonna be 20 megs, 40 megs. So in disk space, it's kind of debatable. I don't really know. And the second uh, one is that native images uh, um, require uh, Linux or Mac OS. So most cloud providers are, are Linux based. So that will work. Uh, the, 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 the advantage of using a native image in that case is that startups are, are fast, but again, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Are you working with a, 
serverless where you just need to run something now and forget for the next 20 minutes or are we talking about an application that needs to uh, have like sub millisecond uh, latency because it's uh, serving millions of requests per second. So in the first case, I would say native images make sense because like they start really fast and you can just run and your system is again free. If you are running a, a mission critical service that gets like uh, thousands of requests per second, then probably a um, long running JVM will give you a better, better result. I don't know if that answers your... Anyone, any more, yes? The, uh, the question is, are there any examples of projects using native images? Um, I'm not working on the, the Growl VM project myself, uh, but I don't think there are that many examples out there, mostly because the, the technology was just presented as open source in February this year, if I'm not mistaken. So everyone is still experimenting. Uh, I'm working with the Vertex project, so because the, the thing with the Vertex project is that uh, when we decided to d build a framework many years ago, we decided to avoid reflection and annotations because of our polyglot aspect. So that was like a head start for us because we can just run. But if you think of uh, frameworks like Spring, they have lots of problems. They don't run yet. And their solution is to was to create an extra a framework called Spring Foo, which is, well, let's be honest, it's not Spring, it's just another project that uses Kotlin that only maps HTTP requests to two handlers, and that kind of, that works. And there are other frameworks out there, for example, Micronaut, which is an opinionated microservice uh, framework, and they have very good documentation, and they claim that most of the things also work, so we're kind of the, the same spot, but no one is really uh, like uh, in the forefront. Everyone is still exploring. And uh, as I said, like the use case is still very vague. It's, it, and it's, it's very shaky. Like every time there's a new release, things either work or break. <laughs> it's more like academical-based research project. I would say so. Like the polyglot aspect of the of the of GraalVM, that's kind of stable, and uh, I think it's it's kind of ready for like some language like JavaScript is like ready for for going into production. But this specific component, I'm, st I'm I wouldn't say that it's like prime time to bet all your microservices or functions on it yet. But that's my personal opinion. <laughs> Any more questions? No. So, oh, no. Uh, JDBC no, because JDBC uses lots of reflection. So in Vertex, we work with Postgres because we know the Postgres protocol and we wrote the, the driver ourselves. And in that case, we have a, a special API for, for it. Well, I think I'm out of time. So if you want to have some links, there, there's the link for the GraalVM. There's a link for Vertex. There's my blog and there's my Twitter handle. It's with a zero because I'm a nerd. So thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>